Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. And sitting down with me today in Belize is David Cates, the CEO and president of Denison Mines. Now, we just threw our conference here on the island with the Real Asset Investor Group. It was a great conference, had about 25 guys down here, and David was kind enough to come down and give the keynote address. Of course, it was about uranium and the cycle that we've entered into, the bull market in uranium, which we called back in beginning of December. Uh, it seems to be confirmed at this point as a real bull market. I think the first question I'm going to ask you, David, is based on the presentation you gave the other day, what's your confidence level that the movement and the price action we had confirms that this is indeed a new bull market in uranium? All right. Thanks, Colin. Uh, appreciate being here, of course, uh, and really enjoyed presenting to the group of guys, uh, really engaged guys. You know, the uranium price has definitely made a real move towards rationality. Uh, I emphasize it's a move. We are not at rationality, uh, but we have seen volumes actually come into the market, uh, and that's really what's been driving the price up. And, uh, you know, uh, we've always kind of said that it, it will take volumes. It will take people buying and selling uranium for us to find a real price. And we've, we've started to see the beginning of that, and I, I think that's a really, really positive sign. You mentioned your excitement, the fact that the bear market was so long and that the decline in the spot price was so deep, which seems like a counterintuitive point coming from the president and CEO of a large uranium company, but maybe looking towards the future, it makes quite a bit of sense. Can you talk about why you're so excited that the bear market was so bad? Well, right. I mean, uh, if you're trying to run a uranium company, um, a bear market this bad has made life very difficult. Uh, but, but what excites me about it is that um, we're in a situation where the production profile and, and, and the pipeline of projects that are out there, uh, they're, they're not really that good. And there, and there aren't any projects that are lined up really well. And, and we looked at a, at a chart during the, present, during, the, uh, during the keynote about low cost, high cost, and, and contrasting that to short term to production versus long term to production. Uh, because of how bad this bear market's been, nobody's been able to move the ball forward. So when you look in that quadrant of short to production uh, and low cost, we don't have any of those assets. So uranium producers are going to be looking for things as this market comes together. Um, utilities are going to be looking for things that they can buy, and there aren't going to be any. And so it's more about the excitement I get as an investor in the uranium space saying that, wow, there really could be a pinch coming up here and owning some really good leveraged uranium assets. This could be a tremendous opportunity. David, I think my most um, interesting slide that you showed on the presentation lined up all the projects globally that were either in production or in development stage ready to go in production. And it pointed out how just how ridiculous an $18 spot price was because as you showed, there was not a single project in the world that could make money at $18 spot price. Can you talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that really, uh, the other thing we plotted on that chart, you remember this, is uh, the spot price where we were at when, when you guys made the call that we had hit the bottom, and that was around 18 bucks. Uh, the reason why I always thought that that was, it was pretty, you know, it, it was out of the box to make a call like that, but I, I think it made sense to do that at that point because $18 was below the lowest cost producer in the world on an all-in basis. Uh, there's barely room for incentive if, if, if you're making all-in, right? You're selling it all-in. Uh, none of us are in the mining business to sell it all-in. So if the very best mine in the world, which is based in Kazakhstan, uh, is, is say $20 or just higher than that on a break-even basis all-in, uh, it, it was simply nonsensical that the price would be at 18 bucks. I, I've always said I think it was great how quickly the price fell apart. Uh, we needed to, to drive a capitulation event. Uh, we needed people to think that the uranium market was never going to return and was going to implode. Those are the sorts of things that have to happen uh, before the market actually does fix itself uh, and before we can rebuild the space. And, and I think that's, that's part of why your call was so well-timed. Uh, it, it just made a lot of sense that $18 was stupid. I think we spoke about this on our last episode. You said in the, in the speech that $40 is the necessary price. What do you mean by that? Is 
the the meaningful number when when the spot price gets there, or is that not even enough? Yeah, forty dollars. I think when I was talking about forty dollars, it was more about uh, looking at that cost curve and saying, you know, where where does where does the production uh, of global mines that are out there, where does it, if you add up all the different mines and their cost profiles, where does it cross the demand that we already have in our market today? Uh, and that's around 40 bucks. Uh, I don't know that $40 fixes this market because, again, everyone needs to be incentivized to actually build these projects, and the projects aren't going to build themselves overnight. Uh, when you chart out to 2025, right, that price goes up more like 50, 60 bucks. And, and if you tie it in with the concept that these projects aren't being built, uh, so some of those items on the cost curve aren't even in production and won't be in production by 2025, well then it's really reasonable to expect that the price is gonna have to go higher than that uh, as the utilities and the buyers are searching for pounds that can come into the market. From a buyer of uranium stocks, in many ways, there's a lot more risk right now than there was back in December in that these stocks are up 100%. Some of the juniors, you look at Goviax, which you're a large shareholder of via Denison Mines, is uh, up for three to 400 percent. And uh, I guess investors want to know where we are right now. Um, you pointed out uh, in, in your speech that 2004 and 2005 had to happen for 2006. And I think what you were trying to say is things aren't going to flip in an instant. Uh, 18 to 26 percentage wise is very meaningful. But as you're describing in the context of production numbers, it doesn't really uh, drive people to put new mines in production. So what do you think in terms of the cycle that's coming up? How is it going to play out? And what, what kind of magnitude of a cycle are we going to have? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, everyone's asking, well, what happens with the equities? What happens with the price? We've seen a bounce. Is, is this it? Uh, look, I, I really do believe that uh, 2017 is very much akin to 2004. But, but I think even bigger than that, right, is uh, thinking about cycles in a broader term. Let's think about the uh, commodity super cycle that we saw uh, driven by China the last time around, where all the commodities came up. Uh, that super cycle didn't happen in one year, right? It was a buildup and people made a lot of money uh, over the horizon of that cycle. So I I've been calling this the uranium super cycle uh, because here's the thing, the last actual super cycle, the broad commodity super cycle, it was driven by China. China didn't have nuclear reactors, uh, not, not, not significant numbers. I mean, today they've got 35 reactors. The U.S., for example, is around 100. But where's China going? China's going to over 200 reactors, you know, in, in the horizon of 2030. So we know that that's on the horizon. We can see the plans. We can see that the Chinese government's committing to that. Uh, that's the makings of of a uranium super cycle. They will become the largest consumer of uranium by a wide margin. And it's all happening with long lead time, nuclear projects, uh, nuclear energy projects that we can see being built. So, uh, you know, I think the fact that we've bounced off the mat, uh, off 18 bucks, it's great. And, 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 and people have definitely made some money on that. But there's so much more to go because we really are just now starting what I think is going to be a uranium super cycle. First time listeners of Palisade Radio tuning into this episode couldn't possibly get a full picture of the uranium story. They're going to have many more questions than answers because uranium is such a complex market. And you brought, you brought up Kazakhstan, which is the state-owned uh, Kazakhstan entity that is the largest producer of uranium in the world. A lot of confusion for people that don't understand just why Kazakhstan actually sells their uranium at spot price. And I think that they've been a big player over the last few years as to why the spot price got as low as it did. But of course, a few a couple months ago, they made a, a huge decision to cut their production back by 10%. And that certainly has played into the uh, uptick in the spot price that we've had. We asked you uh, in a question and answer session why Kazakhstan had made this move. What's the rationality coming into play here? Yeah, absolutely. This move out of Kazakhstan has is, is really been a key catalyst in, in turning things around. Um, why have they made the move? Well, uh, they, they've been working with Scott Melby. Uh, Scott Melby works with, with us uh, when, we're, when we're managing Uranium Participation Corp. So, so we know Scott Melby well. Uh, he's, he's acting as a special advisor uh, to, to Kazatomprom. And uh, really what I think they're doing is something that's happening uh, broadly in, in Kazakhstan, which is taking a look at their national companies, trying to commercialize them. It's not that they're trying to take them uh, 
uh, public or anything like that. They're just trying to commercialize them, take them away from sort of state ruled mentality. And, and, and Scott's been able to give them a lot of insight. And I think the, the point he was making to them, and, and, and I think clearly the point that they've seen is that uh, pulling uranium out of the ground, it's a depleting resource, pulling it out of the ground only to sell it into the spot market at historically low spot prices is probably not the best thing to do. Uh, you know, in, in many ways, they're a steward to their nation uh, because this is their nation's resource. And if you're pulling uranium out of the ground and selling it for less than the all-in cost of developing, uh, you know, that mine on a per pound basis, I mean, how does that really work? And, and I think the biggest upside on this here is that 10% uh, cut from Kazatomprom uh, works out to be more like a 10% cut in the spot market. So how does that work? Well, they're really the they're really selling most of their material into the spot market and the spot market sized around 50 million pounds. So a 10% cut for them is actually translating to about a 10% cut in the spot market and that's meaningful. So beyond that, I think the upside of this is that they're actually starting to think commercially. So this is the first step, could be the first step of many, uh, where we actually see them make other changes. Maybe, maybe they're looking at uh, uh, their supply chain side and, and, and delivery side, are they going to start to carry inventories? They've talked about setting up a uranium fund. I think it's all about them starting to get savvy now. And, and again, just to wrap it all together, think of the impact that could have on a uranium market that's acted slightly irrational, <laughs> very irrational at other times, uh, now to have the market leader actually starting to behave commercially. We haven't had that in the market uh, think of what that could do for the space. That's what gets me excited. David, I like to think that I'm pretty well versed in the sector, but I did learn some new things myself from your presentation yesterday. One of the concepts I had never heard of, but you explained has massive implications on the spot price market. And this works against the spot price in a bear market, but uh, tor um, in a bull market, it actually helps the spot price. And this is called underfeeding. I had no idea what this was. And you gave a very basic explanation on, on how this works and what the implications are. Yeah, absolutely. Underfeeding is, um, I consider it's like a fuel on a fire and it works both ways uh, on the, on, in a good market and a bad market, but, but not the way you'd expect it to. Um, underfeeding is, is, a, is a secondary supply issue. What you've got are um, enrichers that uh, are basically spin centrifuges uh, to, to enrich the uranium. And these centrifuges are... Uh, you know, uh, pieces of equipment that run nonstop. And so their, their costs are very much fixed and, and their profitability as, as operating in a, a, a centrifuge will, will, will vary by how much material they can push through it. Uh, in good times, the centrifuge and, and the enricher is very busy. And so they will push a lot of materials through that centrifuge and they'll deliver the material to their customer. Um, how does that work? Well, they get paid to, to have a certain amount of output. So I equated it to someone who's um, got an orange juice operation. Uh, and what you've got is, uh, is a fixed cost of a person that you have to pay for eight hours to squeeze oranges. Well, you've got an order book, so you've got some oranges that someone's brought you, uh, and you need to convert that into orange juice. And they say, look, I've got X number of oranges. The deal is you're gonna give me five cups of orange juice. Uh, so you say, all right, go ahead, let's start squeezing this orange juice. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze all day until you get your five cups. Okay, here you go. Give it to the customer. Now, uh, you don't have any other orders, but you're still paying your, 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 your laborer in this case to squeeze the oranges all day. So what are the options? He just stands there and squeezes no oranges, or you take the oranges he already squeezed and you tell him, just keep squeezing them. Uh, and what he'll do is just keep squeezing the oranges and you'll get out some residual orange juice. And so maybe what you add is you pulled out five cups, maybe you pull out another one or two cups just by having this guy work another three hours in the day uh, that he was otherwise going to be idle, right? So, so that's what we call underfeeding in a, in a real simple term. Uh, what it means is that when the market is not hot, uh, there aren't a big order book. There isn't a big order book for the enrichers and they're doing a lot of extra squeezing. And, and on the back end of that, producing those pounds, uh, or you know, it's not pounds at that point, but that, the material that goes into fuel at that point is akin to a uranium mine operating that, that wasn't operating before and adding pounds to the market. And obviously the numbers are, are not entirely clear in terms of how much of this is happening, but while underfeeding is happening, 
basically a uranium mine is being created that really doesn't exist. Uh, and, and what we're saying, you, can, you could, be, could be talking 10 to 15 million pounds coming from underfeeding or reprocessing. Uh, that's as big as the biggest of mines, Cigar Lake of MacArthur, 18, 19 million pounds a year. If we're throwing 15 million pounds a year in from underfeeding or reprocessing, uh, that, that certainly is not good. And that's going to happen in a market when things are down. So the market is down, we're oversupplied, and here we go, let's put more supply into the market. The, the, the interesting part is that it flips the other way when the market is good. If I'm an enricher, I want to just take those oranges and make you your five cups of orange juice and take another bag of oranges and do that for another customer. I make more money doing that. So what it means is that when the market is hot and utilities want fuel and they're buying a lot of fuel, uh, I'm actually going to take that 15 million pounds excess off the market. So things are going to get tight and then they're going to get tighter because that fictional uranium mine that existed well, it doesn't exist anymore. We just turned off the tap of a 15 million pound operation. So it acts like a swing, right? It basically will, will cool a cold market and it will heat up a hot market. The type of investors that came to the conference were a very savvy group of people. They're what I would call contrarian, also concerned about potential forces in the overall market, such as a crash like we had in 08, or uh, maybe a issue with the worldwide debt uh, reaching levels it is. And this should be a concern for energy uh, demand for uh, oil and gas, coal, uh, if the world goes into a recession. In theory, uh, these uh, commodities would get pushed down. But you were talking about the fact that uh, going back to the whole super cycle concept here is we don't even need anything to happen because there's already a major problem in China. And I'll let you answer what that is. Uh, but it, it means that nuclear has to happen and it's going to happen. And no matter what happens in the global economy, it would be hard to derail the super cycle that is in action now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'd say that the, the growth in nuclear energy is going to be insensitive uh, to global economic growth. Uh, it's not that it will be totally insensitive. I, I think more global economic growth can't be bad for, for energy stories. And definitely, uh, you know, a massive economic, uh, you know, crash or something would, would generally not be good for any energy. And I think nuclear would be, would be pulled into that to some extent. But, but I, 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 do, I, I do stand by this idea that um, nuclear energy is not being driven, growth in nuclear energy is not being driven by global growth. It's, it's being driven by a commitment to clean the air uh, and, and have green sources of energy. Uh, we look at China. China's air quality is very poor. They've committed to nuclear energy, and they're trying to achieve you know, the low teens in, in clean energy sources, and nuclear is a major part of that. That is not an overly ambitious target, but those growth numbers, you know, the 200 reactors on the horizon, that's what they deem is necessary to actually be able to achieve that. Um, it, it's not just China. It's, it's India. Um, and, and really, at a, the highest of levels, the WNA has got something called the uh, the Harmony Project, and that looks at the the uh, environmental objectives that the world's been setting. And we're talking about that uh, two degree movement uh, that will keep our our planet alive. Basically, uh, they've tried to reverse engineer the power demands of the world uh, and how we can meet those power demands in the future without destroying the world. Uh, and they can't come up with one realistic scenario that doesn't include massive growth in nuclear energy. So uh, global growth is part of it, but it's not the driver. It's really about saving our planet, uh, green energy and clean air. I've seen some rather irrational comparisons drawn in the past uh, by newsletter writers and investors between oil and gas and uranium. And maybe there is some association between the two, but my question doesn't quite have to do with that. Uh, you were talking about the lead time, and I think this is a crucial point to hit home, is with oil and gas, you can quite literally drill a hole into an area where you know there is oil. And so within a month or maybe even less than a month, you can add oil production based on market demand. How does that work with uranium, though? Right. It's not at all the same in the uranium space. And, and I think it's not just investors that, don't, that uh, don't always see that. I think sometimes it's the utility buyers. Um, they're often buying fuel for, for various types of power generation. Uh, and I don't think anyone ever really worries about there not being enough uh, gas or oil out there. It's just a question of what price do I have to pay to bring it online. And that's generally true. Uh, 
uranium is totally different. Uh, we're, we're talking uh, the shortest development times you'd get might be in the five-year range out of out of African projects. Uh, you know, even to bring a shutdown mine back online doesn't happen overnight. But if we want to add like meaningful pounds to the market, you're going to have to go to the large-scale assets, and that's going to probably take you to the Athabasca Basin. And I can speak firsthand about that. Uh, I mean, Denison, we put a PEA out for our Wheeler River project in the beginning of 2016. We set out a timeline that's all based on real guidelines for permitting and construction. Uh, we're, we're talking seven to ten years. Right. We, we strongly believe we're at the front of the pack of the large-scale developers for this cycle, uh, and, and we don't expect to be producing before 2025. So for a utility buyer to be out there or even an investor to say, well, the uranium is going to come on, uh, you know, it, it's just whether the price incense it. I just I just don't believe it. I mean, I don't know where the projects are that can turn on that quickly. You got to remember, we've been in a massive bear cycle. Nobody's been investing in assets to have them ready. And the price is still so low that nobody can even justify really doing that now. Uh, th these projects do not turn on overnight. They're not at all like oil and gas. Based on the spot price of uranium and the stocks associated with them, nobody would ever guess that 2015 actually saw the highest annual growth for nuclear power worldwide. What does that mean, David? Can you talk about that? And how did 2016 look? Well, right. So that, that 2015 stat is actually amazing. And it shocks most people that I talk to that, that 2015, we actually saw the largest net growth in nuclear uh, power generating capacities in 25 years. 2016 was better than 2015. Uh, I mean, what, is, what does it mean for the stocks? Uh, it, it speaks to the super cycle, right? Like th this, this growth is happening, uh, and this is the first step. I mean, we're, we're seeing reactors actually being built and coming onto the grid. And I'm, again, not quite sure that the market recognizes that it's happening. A lot of that growth is in Asia. Um, and so it is not top of the news cycle here in the U.S. or in Canada. Uh, it, it, it just isn't on the top of the radar. In fact, the U.S. sometimes has mixed news uh, where, where you've got uh, reactors that are being shut down prematurely. But really all of that gets eclipsed by this massive growth. And that stat for 2015 and 2016 is actually really proof of that. Uh, if, if the sentiment was, was neutral or people thought nuclear was on the decline because of the news cycle, it's just wrong. I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're in a growth cycle with the most growth we've seen in over 25 years. I started the interview out by talking about the risk to investors coming into the space. If this is not a super cycle, if this has been just a bounce off the bottom, uh, now is a very bad time to invest. We certainly don't think that's the case based on the conversation that we're having right now. GoVX has been the number one performing stock, I believe, uh, that's a uranium stock over the past couple months since this bull market started. And you have a, a, the share position via Denison. Denison is, I believe, the largest shareholder of GoVX. Can you talk a bit about it? Because you mentioned the other night that GoVX has the potential to be a billion dollar company based on their assets. Yeah, I actually do believe that. Uh, you know, we, we had our, we've had African assets in the Denison Group for a number of years, and we really wanted to streamline the story and, and put them in the right vehicle. And, and we obviously looked around at all of the options out there, uh, call it a shopping exercise. We were looking for the vehicle to, to put those African assets into. Uh, we, we, we came to an agreement with Goviex, and we're quite happy about that. Uh, and it's in large part because we really do see Goviex being that company and their Matawela project in, in uh, Niger being a project that ticks all the boxes for a billion dollar takeout down the road. Uh, we compared it with Husab, which was acquired by the Chinese in the last cycle. We compared it to Makuju River, which was acquired by the Russians in the last cycle. Uh, we, we see Matawela ticking all the boxes by comparison, and, and that's really why we wanted to take a position in that company, and we're quite happy to have that position. Uh, we do think that in the next cycle, there's, there's a good chance that that's going to be $800 million to $1 billion company. Uh, so the, the fact that they've been performing so well in the last little bit, I mean, that's like baby steps, right? That's the beginning of where that company goes. Uh, they've got a very large resource base, uh, and a lot of the guys, the utilities who are growing so much, i.e. the Chinese, are very comfortable operating in Africa. Uh, so we see that being a really great story going forward. 
on Thursday morning, Dennis and Mines announced a bought deal financing. I probably should have began the interview talking about this. I think this is probably the first interview that will be released where uh, following the, the $20 million bought deal financing. Investors who are curious about why you're taking the money in, can you talk a bit about use of proceeds and the rationale behind raising $20 million? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of that money is flow through, uh, which which means we're going to spend it by drilling in the ground in, in, in northern Saskatchewan, primarily at Wheeler River over the next two years. Uh, the financing is really all about flexibility. We, we added just over $40 million to our balance sheet a few weeks earlier uh, in a financing deal with Anglo Pacific Group, uh, where we, we basically sold our uh, certain rights to a tolling stream. So it was a non-dilutive event. Uh, there's no lost uranium exposure on that deal. Uh, putting the two of these financings together, we're going to have a super, super strong balance sheet. Uh, we want the market to know that we're funded, that we have the flexibility to move Wheeler River or any of our assets forward at the pace that we choose. Uh, I love the idea of being able to market for the next two years uh, without having to go back to the market for even a flow-through dollar because you know what guys, the next two years things are going to get exciting and people are going to be looking for stories that they can put their money into. They're going to have to buy our stock on the market uh, and, and that means that we could have a tremendous amount of leverage. So that, that's really what we're doing. We want to have uh, flexibility uh, and be ready to do whatever we need to do over the next two years. A final point here in question for the interview. We spoke about this briefly. Uh, strength, I believe, trumps dilution in a bull market. And that's been obvious. So look at Goviax. They uh, did a semi dilutive financing, they took in a good amount of money there at 10 cents. And some people might have been of the opinion that uh, they should have taken in less, but the share price is up from 10 cents to 40 cents. Uh, you know, Denison, that's not a very dilutive financing that you've just done. The share price is already up, so that's a great job. But just talk a little bit about your your own opinions on uh, the strength potentially trumping the uh, the dilution factor. Well, I think we know that this market has companies that need to raise money uh, because they aren't producing uranium miners. Uh, there's, there's only two of those really uh, in the public market, Cameco and Paladin. Um, everybody else is in the development or exploration space, so absolutely dilution is part of the story. Uh, I, think, I think you're right. You know, you always have to be careful about how you raise your money, and you have to be mindful of dilution, but really this cycle is going to come down to the assets that you've got. And the companies that have made it through the really tough market and the companies that exist today, they've done it by probably being responsible with their dollars. Uh, and, and really, whatever dilution they've had to incur in the past, uh, that's behind, right? If you're looking at the space now, that, that, that doesn't matter to you. Uh, you're going to look at who has the best assets and who, what story has leverage to this uranium price. Uh, I, I think you're right. I mean, d dilution is something you always have to manage, but at the end of the day, you should be buying things for, for the assets under the roof. Well, David, I have to thank you again for coming all the way down here to Belize and giving the keynote address here at the conference, the Palisade Hard Asset Investor Conference, and hopefully we'll throw another one here in the next uh, six to 12 months. We'd love to have you back down when we do that. And for any of our listeners that might be interested in participating in a future event, if we do plan one, feel free to send me an email anytime, Colin at PalisadeGlobal.com, and I'll be sure to put you on the list for future consideration. David, thanks for coming down. Yeah, Colin, absolutely my pleasure. Really enjoyed uh, being able to meet the guys that came to this conference. And it always helps me to hear what investors are thinking. And I'm just happy that I could answer so many questions about uranium and, and get us all set up for this, uh, this next cycle. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector junior mining sector are good people and kind people hit the bid how violent that term could be it actually could be quite violent uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally and the world is always going to need raw material it's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth totally destabilized hey hey troll did you hear what's going on in yemen are you too stupid 